too so that's that makes <laughs> it Good. We are live. We're live, Jeff. We are completely live. Welcome to the show, everyone. I've got Jeff Levin, who spent 50 years in Scientology. That's an unimaginably long time, although according to my demographics, many of you can imagine such a length of time. I'm just 34 at this time, and I'm learning a lot about life and a lot about Scientology. Well, Jeff knows as much as anyone really, having spent so much time in it and having been part of this, you know, been around the Celebrity Center, and he was uh, had a popular band called People. He lost both of his children to the cult. I believe they've disconnected from him and now his acclaimed documentary Brothers Broken is showing at festivals. It gives us an insight into his tumultuous relationship with his brother, Robbie Levin, who are, you know, they're reunited now. We'll be talking about Scientology and Second Chances. Jeff, right, it's the decade of love. People are watching James Bond, I think. England won the World Cup. That's soccer uh, for anybody outside of England. And you're in a big band, huge band called People. How do you end up in Scientology? Uh, the simple answer, uh, I wanted to belong. I, my family, I had good parents, but they didn't, they were from that generation. My dad was 39 when he, when I was born, he wasn't, he was uh, in the Philippines in World War II when I was born. And so he wasn't even there. And they, my feeling is they looked at me like, what is this thing that we now have in our house? Mm -hmm. I was kind of like an alien. No one had ever taught them what it is to be a parent. They only knew their parents who were from uh, white Russia in near Poland. So they were talking, they were second generation. They uh, first generation Americans, really. I see. And, and so they had no reference point on how to raise me. So the way I got raised was just go outside and play. That would that it. be would that be a, a Jewish immigration? I'm just thinking now. Levin yes, yes. Russia, both both hmm. parents um, were their grandparents were from kind of very close to each other. They didn't know each other, but they were both in the same area. And my mom ended up in Vancouver. My dad ended up in San Francisco, and then they met and the rest is history. But they were, um, with me, they didn't know what to do. And I didn't even know about that kids got hugged until oh, right. I was an adult. Yeah. There's something they, about that generation, isn't there? Yeah, it's a war baby, baby boomers, war baby. And um, they're the pre-war baby generation. They, they were yeah. they grew up in the depression so so anyway uh joining scientology the first thing they do is is love bomb you which is a term i think everybody understands where you just feel immediately like you belong you're right away and so yeah. for me it was um, a no-brainer although i was turned on to the precepts of Hubbard in 1963. So if you want to talk about how long I was thinking about Scientology or, or believed in it, it's <clears throat> closer to 57, 58 years. My word. Again, unimaginably long uh, for, for me. But yeah, that, the reason I asked about, about the Judaism part is it just interests me that Tom Cruise, I've heard him say, um, you, you, you can be Jewish and Scientologist, you can be a Muslim and Scientologist, you can be anything. And I, I suppose that's true, is it? No, it's absolutely not true. Hmm. They, they like to make out like you can practice huh. another religion. It's completely uh, against the precepts to do anything more than maybe you could wow. have a Passover dinner, which is very important in Judaism. And there are Jews in Scientology and they do kind of congregate together oh, wow. a little bit. You, can, you, you would be really looked down upon if you went to Temple though on Sunday. If you, if you actually were a practicing Jew, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let you do that basically. And um, I know when I was in, you know, there was a, a Jewish Israeli community and 
So I think I got invited to one Passover dinner. Do they take it seriously as a religion? No. There's only one true path, and that's Scientology, period. Mm, my that's word. It. Well, I understand. So it's interesting. I guess Tom Cruise is he's just doing a bit of marketing spiel there, and then once you're in, it's too late. Well, just for those who, who might not under, understand the way a celebrity Scientologist operates, and I founded, I was with a third founding staff member at Celebrity Center in 1969, so I understand Celebrity mm. Center and what Hubbard was doing. He was, he was not stupid. And he saw, okay, positioning. He was he understood marketing. Okay, if you if I can position celebrities with Scientology, hmm, I could get a lot more people into Scientology. So he talked about that. And then when Celebrity Center developed, it was very successful. And I was mentioning, like I I met uh, Candace Bergman, who was uh, dabbling in it. Just very briefly, she dabbled in it, but I met her. And then I met um, the big film producer, Don Simpson, who, who's mm. dead. He died, but he and Jerry Bruckheimer produced Flashdance, which was a huge hit. And then they went on to just a number of, of hit films. And now Top Gun 2 is the latest blockbuster and it connected to that group. And Don Simpson was involved in Scientology. So they were getting some good um, celebrities into Scientology, some of them before they were big hits. Um, Interesting. And where were you I mean, on that scale at, at that point? Had you started with people? Had people taken off by then? Well, my group people, we were in the Bay Area and we grew up with the other bands. And I actually performed with Jerry Garcia pre prior to The Grateful Dead because he was into wow. bluegrass at the time. And, um, but they were, the transition, <clears throat> the transition from folk music to uh, rock was really dramatic. It literally happened overnight. Um, folk, everyone would look down their nose at rock and roll and anything but an acoustic guitar, pretty much. Electric guitars were forbidden. In, mm. in the folk clubs and then all of a sudden the Beatles hit the Stones hit and the English invasion hit and everyone just loved the Stones loved the Beatles loved uh, there are so many different groups uh, the Zombies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, which so, is where I love you oh so, sorry I cut for a second what did you no, say no no that's all right go ahead oh, oh um, just I go on Go on. <laughs> well, I was just saying that we were listening to all the English groups. And and so it was like, okay, we all have to start bands. And that's where the Jefferson Airplane uh, with Grace Slick and, Yorma, and then Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead, they were called the Warlocks. They were a little ahead of everyone else. So they were doing a blues band. And, and then the Dead just took off and then everyone was going up to the Avalon Ballroom in the Fillmore, getting stoned and then going up and getting stoned again when they were there <laughs> and <laughs> dancing. And, and, um, and there was just this cultural revolution in, in the around 63, 64. And, um, but it, the English groups were really the ones that brought blues and all this stuff to america mm. in a, in the form of rock and roll and and like the zombies were more jazzy yeah. jazz yeah. and i'm very proud of of what we've uh what we brought over i suppose i i seem to recall there's like i don't know if it's actually a real thing that happened but this legendary night where bob dylan sort of halfway through a concert changed from a, a an acoustic guitar to an electric guitar and the crowd booed or something like that and then and then from that moment on there was a big change is that in my head is that real no it's not in your head that's exactly what happened <clears throat> it <clears throat> was there it was um it was in the air because of the British invasion, I think more than anything, they the British rock changed the way music was done. For one thing, they wrote their own songs, oh, and yeah. then 
so in prior in America, you had songwriters. That's all they did. They were songwriters, and they wrote the songs. And then the record companies would give the band or the group the song, and then they would sing it and have a hit record. You know, Annette Funicello. Um, Fascinating how it's how it changed. And, and so, what up. what point of because because I saw in your documentary that at one point you say that you started to credit Scientology with the success of the band. So when when you entered into Scientology, where were people at? Were you already famous by that stage? We had built the momentum. It was already there. We had cut our hit record. It wasn't a hit then, but we had cut it, and now it was starting to get on the charts. And mm -hmm. we had the backing of several A&R people at Capitol Records. Uh, a shout out to Don Gerson, who was instrumental in helping uh, the radio st getting the radio stations to play the song and we were already on our way and at the time we were looking at we were going to do transcendental meditation to try to get grow up really mm -hmm. and, and to try to, to, to smooth out the bands you know we were kids basically and so I was like the cat herder, you could say. I was the oldest guy, and I had the I had the van. Therefore, I was a leader of the group, right? <laughs> but um, so we were going to do transcendental meditation to try to learn how to get along better. And then Scientology, uh, one of the band members uh, saw a bumper sticker, and then he said, "Why don't we try this thing?" And I already knew about Scientology because someone had proselytized to me um, my music mentor, David Nelson, who's also played with Gar Jerry Garcia. And then he had his own band, New Riders of the Purple Sage. And David turned me on to Scientology in 1963 and gave me a little book in which I read. It was really simple. And at the same time, he turned me on to pot which I didn't I know about. So I got <laughs> um, I got my head turned around pretty pretty heavily one night. And, and then, so I knew about it, but I never did anything about it. I didn't know any location of where any Scientology missions were. And then in 60, um, 68, uh, one of the band members saw something. And so I was like, hey, I didn't know that was around here. And I went down there and immediately I was sucked in. I mean, instantaneously almost. I was like, this is for me because I already knew about it. Mm, interesting. Do you do you think, I was going to make the joke of, you know, you, you started smoking pot and then reading this stuff. And like, I was going to think, you know, what must Lord Zenu have been like? But I, I now gather you don't actually get to learn about Lord Zenu for some time. So what was... What was it that you'd learned about Scientology in the early days? Well, it, it was a, a really a takeoff on Buddhism. Mm. It, it was really, uh, I had never thought about it. And, and Hubbard talked about that we were immortal spirits and that we had lost most of our powers. So instead of, of you having to broadcast you have the power you could broadcast on YouTube without any video or anything if you had the power, mm -hmm. right? And um, those were the kind of powers. We're talking telepathy, telekinesis, you know, being able to move objects, being able to change, ob you know, change uh, materials. And those, Hubbard promised that that was our real powers. And that That's we very appealing very appealing to someone whose maturity level was about 13 or 14 even though i was <laughs> older i wasn't very mature hey that's appealing to me now like you know the, I, I still do it sometimes you know watching matilda or, or whatever and you want to try and move the desk or move the pen or something i can see how that's really appealing to to people and was, was it also a case of wanting to feel um and i always ask people this when they've gone into scientology to feel a little bit special well, the elitism is unbelievable. Once you uh, see that you're going to achieve these powers and that there's no other path towards that, 
then you're mm. like, okay, I'm in for the long haul. I'm in it for the next. And you've heard about the billion year contract that you sign if you're a staff member in the mm. inner sanctum. Well, that made sense to me. It makes sense to every other person who believes that, that they're coming back and they're in it for the long term. Is and, there something a, a bit like all religions, um, a fear of death? Oh, they play on the fear uh, tremendously. And, and if you listen to the Hubbard lectures over and over again, he really talks about this is your only chance. And do you want to be uh, relegated to a, a tiny cinder of who you really are? you know, a little burnt cinder, that's what you're going to turn into. And at the time, there was still the Cold War threat. So that was there too. So we're like, well, if things do blow up, we know that we can come back or we can go to another planet. That was the point of view. So we're talking, and I was a big fan of science fiction already. And then going into the whole thing of Xenu and that's pure science fiction that he created from from really uh, taking earlier writers and earlier mystical writers and fiction writers and then morphing that into his own scenario that would that uh, apparently he was the only one who figured out the truth mm -hmm. and and anything that he said was the truth. So you're looking at it's uber or when you look at a Scientologist, in my opinion, uh, you're looking at someone who is uh, seriously um, orthodox. Hmm. I see. Did your light just go out? Did we yeah, lose some did. light? Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk for a second while, while you have yeah. a look at that. Maybe it's run out of something. Don't worry too much if it, if it has. Um, it is no. It's just such an interesting thing to see how people get uh, into these things, and we've seen time and time again that it's not, uh, it's not about sort of intelligence and things like that. I think a lot of people say, "Oh, I'm not. I could never get. I could never fall for that." But uh, it is about maybe not receiving enough love as a child, like you've said. It is about wanting yeah. to feel special. It is about fear of death. How many uh, did you go up the OTs? Did you did you get lots of these OTs? Well, uh, let me just talk about that, what that means a little bit, a little bit of a mm -hmm. definition for people who don't, mm. all this, that's the other thing is the nomenclature of that particular group of Scientology, it's massive. They have a dictionary, let's see, that thick of, of terms that you have to learn. So you, you could say there's a thing called Scientology speak. You know, in other words, I could I could use a number of terms and you would have no idea what I'm talking about. One of the terms is OT, operating Thetan. And the thing that I had learned those many years ago in 1963 was the term Thetan, T-H-E-T-A-N. And Hubbard took this uh, symbol, Theta, which is a Greek symbol, and um. And then he added the N on it, so it was a noun. And he didn't want to describe the state that we're supposed to achieve um, as, a, a, as a spiritual being or a soul. So he had to come up with a new word for this a spiritual enlightenment of us as a spiritual being. And he called it Thetan. Mm -hmm. So every Scientologist views himself as a Thetan right there, that's going to be weird for someone who has no clue about Scientology, right? Yes. Because, oh, I'm a Thetan. Now, if I say that to another Scientologist, they're like, of course you are. And then what Hubbard did is he gave it a, uh, an enlightened state. So if you pay enough money and do these levels, when I say pay enough money, we're not talking about a few thousand dollars or 10,000. We're talking about to achieve the 
OT, which in O means operating, so operating Thetan. And what that meant was that I could literally operate outside my body. And, and if I wanted to, I could be talking to you here, but I could go and transport my Thetan or my, my perception. I... I could figure out where you are, go into, the, into your room and be talking to you and at the same time looking at the back of your head. Does this is like, um, yeah, do you remember that uh, episode I did with Katie Lohman, who's the current uh, yeah, Scientologist? Yeah. Right. And she said that Tom Cruise visited her in a dream kind of thing to say, come and join Scientology. So I guess, I mean, Erin said that doesn't happen. You don't go into people's dreams in Scientology. But I suppose that's a, a sort of a bizarre version of what you're saying, that she believes she can, that Tom could travel into her room and communicate with her. Well, that's supposed to be the end result of paying all this money and doing all this, uh, these training things and all these levels, therapy yeah. levels and stuff like that. So the OT, I, to answer your question, because I've been trying to just maybe give your viewers a little background so it makes sense. Um, I got up to one of the uh, not the high do the levels that explained those I almost got up to the highest level so I did what well, I started to do there are OT or operating Thetan levels are um, uh, one through eight so in prior to that there's a state of clear where you have supposedly removed all the painful uh, incidents in your mind that you have. So you're no longer supposed to be reacting to things once you go clear. Mm -hmm. So you have that level, which takes some work to get to just in itself, it can be very, take a long time and be expensive. If you have the money, you can go, by the way, if you have the money, you can do anything in Scientology pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. well, so how far up did you get? To, did you get to eight? No, I got to uh, through five and started six. So we're talking several hundred thousand dollars at this point. Minimally. And I'm not, I was never rich. But yeah, somehow... I'm wondering where this money came from and, and went. Wow. Well, I, I worked hard. I, I've been a, a composer for many years and I, I did build up my catalog of music, both in films and TV. And then I have a lot of, you know, if people want to look me up online. I, my credits are on my website pretty much. Of course. A lot of, and, and I've been fortunate to have um, music in some well-known TV shows, you know, like um, The Office or one of my favorite shows, or it's almost off the air, but Blacklist and... Uh -huh. These are American TV shows. Sure. But then I've so, had, did you I, write The Office? Is is theme? I tune? didn't. I didn't write the theme, but I had music in the show. Oh, cool. So, and, would you be able to give us a? And you don't obviously don't have to if you, if you don't. Would you be able to give us a figure of how much you think you put, invested into Scientology over the years? Oh uh, yeah, damn it! This light just yeah. I, yeah well, I'll, I'll, it must be on a timer or something. Oh, um, you know. So I, thank you. You're right. <laughs> Let me just. I'm pretty smart with these things, yeah. maybe. It's the only things I'm... For anyone who's just joined us, by the way, I've got Jeff Levin here, who was in a band called People. He was a Scientologist for about 50 years, which is which is one of the most of anyone that ever. Um, and he's a fascinating person, and there's a film out, so every, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end, of course. And hit the like button. I think that probably makes this video go to more people, and it would be very much appreciated. Uh, and also your questions, a lot of you are asking questions, and I'm just sort of tapping the favorites button so that I can look at them at the end um, and ask Yeah, Jeff, I'm happy so. to answer any question, including mm. any um, antagonistic questions or anybody. Hmm. I'm happy to be put on the spot. I've spent so much time involved in helping that group and um, being on the inside of that group to some degree. I mean, in terms of being around the executives and celebrities and stuff. So uh, I've met almost everyone. Well, what would you say? What, what, what yeah, would you be able to give us that figure of how much you think you put? Oh, into yeah. That, well, including 
that I spent $100,000 on my ex-wife for her to do her Scientology. Mm-hmm. That's just for her. And um, so uh, probably close to five to 600,000 at least. Yeah. And then there's inflation as well. Yeah, no. And and some of that goes back to the first big thing I did was when our record, I got my first record royalty. Guess where it went? Oh, man. Yeah, man, it's amazing. The amount of money they're making from people is extraordinary. Because I just feel like it's, uh, there's so much stuff that I think, oh, I'll do that. And maybe that's a sign of the my wealth or, or, or lack thereof uh, at my age. But I just feel like, you know, if anything's like over 100 pounds or something, I think, oh, I'm not doing that, even if it does give me an extra life and stuff like that. But yeah, you put a lot in and it bankrupts people, doesn't it? Uh, well, here's where I was at. It, and I won't get into it in detail. It's in our movie, which hopefully it, our movie's not out yet. Just it was in a film festival, and it might be back online in another film festival, so people could watch it. At least our goal, of course, is to get it on the. <laughs> uh, um, is to get it. On, maybe we should just leave it. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Distracting, but um, our goal was. Uh, to, is to sell it and to get it on a major platform because I feel our story is relevant. It's about family. It's not. It's about music. It's about, um, and I, I call a family not only my brother, but my band members. And they were be, betrayed when we joined Scientology to some degree yeah. because, but so I was, what was the question, though? I'm, I'm off track. Oh, I, I don't actually, I don't remember, but I'm just thinking of another one now, just uh, obviously yeah. your brother, Robbie. So you had this, you know what's funny is because you spoke of, I think this was you, I was listening uh, quickly while sort of writing things, so I sometimes miss things, but I think, did you, you took him when you were three years old to sort of offer to the neighbors? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I well, did the same thing with my brother. You, you did? Yeah, well, it wasn't, the, it was that we had a live-in, person i don't know what they were but they were helping my mum for like a few weeks uh, right after my brother's birth and apparently when she left i was like can you're not taking him with are you kidding me like take you gotta you're supposed to i thought the woman who left was gonna take my brother with and uh you know he stayed for it's been 30 years now wow well Um, i I think i was happy being an only child and and then I, I see that there's probably more to it than that because um, I do believe in karma and, and I believe that we do have a sense of reincarnation, that we do live more than one life. That's just the way I believe. But um, I reacted really strongly t- uh, about my brother. And and so, yes, I... Um, I wanted to get rid of him immediately. And I do, I actually, my memory is interesting. I remember one picture from being about three years old. And that was my mom walking, coming towards the house, just coming home from the hospital with the baby in her arms. And then I blanked out. I don't remember. Hmm. They told me what happened after that. I went ballistic. Uh, turned the hose on. I was, you know, big enough to do that kind of stuff, and then sprayed myself with water and got myself completely all muddy and wet. Yeah. So it was like a tantrum. Yeah, and I suppose a, a metaphor of, of what was to come in a sense. Um, well, the 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 disputes or and the difficulties with with your brother because he he joined Scientology, and then he left and you stayed. And right. Was he was he in your band with you in People? Well, from the start, Robbie, I, I'm the one who picked up music, and then I was the big brother. And so he had, he had a guitar before me, and mm-hmm. he wasn't interested in it. He was more interested in school and sports and stuff. And so uh, one day, my cousin came over, who was older, and played me a Jewish folk song and that was it. I was hooked. I grabbed my brother's guitar and started playing. So 
when after my brother saw what I was doing, then he got interested. And so then he started playing and he started playing mandolin because it was folk music mm. at that time. And then from that, so we had a bluegrass band together. He was part of. And then from that, we graduated pretty immediately into a rock band. And so he played bass, I played guitar. And then we mm -hmm. had, we pulled together a band pretty quickly. And you moved together into Scientology. Uh, well, and then together. he left. Yeah. He left oh. pretty early, really. He was, he was uh, pretty, he was zealous like me for a few years. But then he was, he was very um, industrious and he took what he had learned because the whole thing of Scientology that's attractive is that it's instant wisdom. So when we first got in, we thought, wow, we're going to be wise. You know, what some um, scholars took or uh, like philosophers took decades to do, we were going to do in two months. Mm -hmm. And so there was some very good stuff that we could assimilate. So between, he took that and eventually became very successful as a business person and formed a clothing company with a partner and they did really well and he was very good at being uh, running the company with his partner and so then he took off but that kept him really busy so pretty quickly he he just didn't have time mm -hmm. whereas for okay. me i was involved with scientology artists other music artists and so I stayed in, plus I really, I craved that attention and approval, which I would get as a performing artist. So I did, if you want to talk about the non-financial donation I made, which would, if you translate it into, into what I got paid, it would probably be another few, you know, quarter of a million dollars in terms of the amount of performances I did pro bono for Scientology. Yeah, it's mad. Like it's that. Mad. Which, so. Yeah. And then, so he left and then, I mean, this was a big part of the film, of course, Brothers Broken. Uh, right. How long did you go without speaking? Was there a big bust up, a big argument? There was no argument. He, I saw that he was becoming I, I, less interested now, if you are um, a hardcore believer, mm -hmm. then you're always on the lookout for people who are allegedly believe as strongly as you do. But you're always on the lookout. Well, is somebody becoming less dedicated? What's their and, and if they are, then it, they really have a serious problem. And that's my, the outlook of a Scientologist is the only people on this planet who have a potential to be enlightened and to save civilization are Scientologists. That's not, a, that is a hardcore belief. Yeah. And, and, the, and the woman that you talked to, I don't know if she gave you that point of view. It, it It's about as elitist as you can get. You, it's as orthodox as any uh, any of the extreme orthodoxy of religions that I've seen. I see. So, I see. so you and mm. I are are we're kind of I'm really screwed up because now I'm speaking out against it, or not against it. I'm just speaking about the truth of it, exposing it. So I'm 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 going to burn in whatever hell Hubbard might have made up, but yeah. people. So everybody else other than Scientologists are either potential Scientologists. So your viewers watching, you, you are all potential um, marks. I will, that's my opinion. You're all potential people who could join and help save the planet, right? Does that... and, and how, yeah, but I'm, I'm just thinking, so then, so then it's decades of just not talking to your brother. Yeah, well... Uh, he sat me down and he knew a lot of information 
I had no clue about because he had a lot of information that I didn't have. That was true. And when you're in the bubble, you're, you're actually warned and um, you're actually admonished if, if you read anything that might say anything negative about Hubbard or Scientology. So I, I read nothing because they have thought police. They have their version of thought police. So um, I knew nothing and he tried to tell me and I was like, dude, you're, you're really messed up if you think I'm going to believe what you're saying about Hubbard or anything. And so I just felt like, damn, well, I had, and then, and then I was told because I was doing quotes, the, one of the OT levels, because I was trying to get up to a higher enlightenment. And, you know, so you're putting hard money and hard time into doing that. And finally they said, you need to, let your brother know that you're not going to talk to him anymore. So here's what happened. I was in one of the organizations. Uh, it's called the advanced organization, which makes sense. That's where you get to spend more money and get into a higher level. And, and so between breaks in getting the therapy, or they call it auditing, to enlighten you, at the time, uh, I got on a payphone. This is cold called my brother up and just basically said, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to sever my connection to you completely unless you're going to uh, change and recant everything you've said, then I'll never talk to you again. And that's what I said on the payphone. <laughs> I mean, how I did remember, he respond at the time? I don't know. He he was like, well, would you still send me your music? Because I used to send him my music because he, he loved that I was a composer and I was writing and recording all the time. I That's said, really no, sad. no, I'm not going to have any connection to you. And um, we got along, you know, I mean, when we were kids, we didn't, I didn't, I didn't get along with him more than he didn't get along with me. And then, uh, but once we both got in Scientology, we, we did get along that we, and then we're getting along fine. And then that came up and this was 1984. And um, I basically, that was it, 1984 to 2012. So whatever that is. It's a part in the film that's very moving um, where he, you know, it's so hard because he's, it's so clear just watching him sitting next to you that he looks up to you and always has done so much. Uh, and he really, the emotions get the better of him, I suppose, when he talks about um, when your father was dying in the hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say no spoiler alerts, but, but oh, no, sorry. No, that's, People no, will no, still no. watch it. No, 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 that's, that's, that's a good one. There's only one thing that I wouldn't want to talk about in the movie. Okay. Okay. I think you, you got to let people just see it. But yeah, I mean, I was cold. I mean, and that's one of the other points I can make to people because I've spent, I'm still deprogramming and I've been out, I was under the radar and that's when I started, but I didn't really get out till 2018, not officially. Mm -hmm. I started deprogramming around 2012, at the beginning of 12, um, 2012. So, um, what was my point? The, uh, about your father. Oh yeah. Um, you don't care about your family other than if they can help you in some way, pay for more Scientology or wow, it's a drug. Oh, well, I call myself, um, I was talking with a wonderful man who was an alcoholic and he's very big in the music business and um, big songwriter, I mean, huge. And, and, and I just, he had talked about a little bit in public about his alcoholism. And I went up to him after and I said, that was such a moving um, 
I mean, I can say who it is because he's very open about Paul Williams, the songwriter mm. who has written all these hip songs. Um, like right. we've only, we've only just begun. He wrote that. And we've written. only just begun. begun. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, wonderful man. He went through his demons at, at a certain time. And, and I said, well, I can relate to the problems you had because I was a cultaholic for almost 50 years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's that, also this, sorry, I was just going to say there's this thing of like, I, I gather about Thetans, because I remember Mike Rinder just when he was told that his child had died or not made it, uh, and he just, he was a bit sad, but then thought, okay, well, it's just a body Thetan, right? Well, okay, the term body Thetan is specific to Xenu. Hmm. So I'm just going to clarify for you. But yeah, he's okay. just, a, he will live again. So he, so it was... He, he didn't live a full life, but that's fine. He will come back. So I'm not going to grieve. I'm not did you gonna... feel that way about your father? I actually did show some emotion, finally, when I got there. But it was really hard for me. And it was, it was very difficult. The, the, I think the, the thing that I remember now is that in this particular organization and I would call it a quasi religion. It's all about you. And they, they play on developing narcissism. These are my opinions and what I've observed. And if you're going to be a member, the thing they play on is whatever it is, your fears, but also what do you really want for yourself? Mm -hmm. And what, what I mean by that is, remember, I talked about, okay, we're going to be godlike again. We're going to have God powers. So that really plays on your narcissism. And we're the elite. So everyone else is below us until they have the realization, oh, my God, I need to be in this group because the only group in the universe. Now, this is really true in the universe that is going to save us. So. Evidently, there are no off-world, um, you know, extraterrestrials who are that enlightened that are they're going to come down and help us make peace or be more enlightened. So that was the claim in the universe. That's a fairly large area. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it, go on. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. No, I I talk too much though. So. Right. No, you've talked the perfect amount. Uh, I, just people, some people in the in the comments are saying, you know, Paul McCartney. Uh, I put on the on the thumbnail. There's a picture. Is it you with Paul McCartney? Oh, oh, it is. Uh, um, As, so people are saying, my, oh, he, he he wasn't a Scientologist, was he? And I'm and I just want to clarify. Well, I didn't I'll, mean I'll to tell suggest. The story. I, I, go, oh, these are stories on. that I get to tell because they're not in the movie, but I think yeah. they're they're fun. I mean, the Beatles changed my life. What can I say? I mean, I'm, uh, I mean, music changed my life, and that is mm. in the movie. And then, but the, I would say the music that excited me and completely got me, made me happy. When I listened to the Beatles, I would be happy. And um, so, a, a I, I, any chance to get around the Beatles or be, and it just so happened, and I believe in, I don't believe there's coincidences. I believe that we make our coincidences. Mm. So in other words, it's not just luck. I think we have intentions. And if we just keep, if we're really pure on it, then things will happen. You know, mm. the yes. universe or um, higher power, I think things can happen. Um and so it just so happened Paul McCartney was at, at Capitol Records for the distribution event. They have everybody who was involved with Capitol. They all got together at the Capitol Records building. Hmm. And we were slated to play there for all of those people. So Paul McCartney was there. And wow. then after after we played or something, and he was being ex he was accessible. He was. I mean, this is a long time ago. 
So they were super superstars, but not as big as they were going to get a lot bigger than they were. Wow. So well, every look, yeah. he go That's ahead. No, I was just going to say I, I didn't mean to suggest to people that he was in Scientology. And I've got something. In oh mind, no, no, but, no. But yeah. but here's the stupid story. Oh, God. Go on. Um, and I don't know if anybody else can claim this, but I could claim it. I was a zealot by then. Okay, a Scientology zealot by that time. And so, and there's Paul standing in this big open area and I don't think anybody was around him. I think people were a little bit intimidated, understandably. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't, I was pretty fearless and I loved, I loved the Beatles. So I went up to him right away and said, hi, I, we're a band, we're with Capital and, and, and I'm, I really love your music and everything. And then here's the next words out of my mouth. Have you heard of Scientology? <laughs> so, so, you nearly convinced him. I, I mentioned something to him. And that was, I was, if, if you look at it, it was pretty dumb. In terms well, he was the, quite into spirit. They were all into spirituality. In another oh, life, yeah. he said he, you could have converted him. Well, uh, I, anyway, I, I know I mentioned, I was probably the first one I assumed to actually approach him and mention it. And, um, and he was like, I think he was very polite, really nice. And he listened and then, then there were other people, you know, to talk to him, but it, it, I don't know. I don't regret anything I've done at this point. And I love that I got to get a, that was my, I, I took my Polaroid camera and I said, take a huh. picture, you know? And so we got the picture and, and I'm, I, I'm appreciative and grateful that I got to meet him because their, their music, I'm a songwriter too. And it just inspired me to write so yeah, much. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's amazing. Wow. Oh, and like I say, it's a sliding door moment because that could have been the moment that Paul McCartney got into Scientology and the whole world uh, could have, could have changed. Um, let's, should we get on to some of the, some of yeah. the questions from people? Because sure. there's, there's, there's loads and people put, put them in if you want. You have to answer them quite quickly because there's quite, I, quite I will. a lot I'll over. try to be, because I tend to be long-winded. No, um, you're not. You're not. But it's just because there's so many questions. That's all. Okay. That's all. No, I'll so try to got... answer each one as quickly as I can. Let Let me see. Can I find them? Well, Simon Roper. What's he written? Jeff and Andrew. A stipend. What do? Because I think I'm other kin. We have oral tradition amnesia when we came down from the trees. Simon, I don't know what that means. Um, and I don't. I don't know mm. if Jeff knows. I know what other other kin. It means you. Um. Well, when he says you, come you, down from the trees, uh, if you're looking at us as being descendants of like the apes or of uh, developing, I mean, that's not the theory in Scientology. No. I mean, yes, uh, as spiritual beings, or as they call it, a Thetan, we have many lifetimes. And mm. we, and the whole idea is when you're in Scientology, you are you will be able to recall your prior lifetimes and when you go when you die you'll be able to remember your last lifetime yeah uh, well there you and, go and so, carry, so yeah. i don't know if that answers your question but i think it's the best we'll get for now unless simon is able to clarify uh okay. but sime set so says did you know david miscavige's dad is that ron miscavige yes i knew ron pretty well and we played together we performed and he was a sweet guy, a really mm. nice guy, good trumpet player. So mm. I knew him, yes. And, and he, before he died, I got a chance to do an interview. He interviewed me, and, and but we'd always been friendly. Oh, well, that's because nice. It's very sad that he, he passed and didn't have a relationship with his son by the end. Yeah, well, but he, he had his music, and I, and I love that he, that carried him through. Mm. That's very beautiful and interesting to know as well. We've got uh, Toki Tim who says, "Hi Andrew, how long will science take to make resurrection a reality?" I did. There are people who freeze themselves, aren't there? And and I did look into something a while ago. You can sign up to some sort of insurance yeah. where they they catch you 
uh, as your if if you're ever in an accident, like they call this number or whatever, and then you, they go and get you and they replace your blood immediately with some fluid. Uh, here's a question though. Here, here's an interesting point because hmm. a great deal of uh, people do believe that we move on and that we do we do reincarnate. So what if you've moved on? Your body gets uh, resuscitated a hundred years later and you're gone as a spirit, you're gone. You know, what happens? Well, Does go. another spirit take over? <laughs> yeah, I'm just posting. I that think that's, that's a flaw in the resurrection thing from my point of view, but I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, but who knows? Who knows what it would mean? Well, I don't know exactly, but... Tim Greenglass, I'd like to know, did Mr. Levin root out in or route out in good standing? Did he experience harassments? Oh, um, no, I, I just kind of faded away. And mm. then and then when the band when the band was ready to uh, do a crowdfunding, that was it. That was my coming out. Prior to that, I was under the radar. So in fact, I even did a course when I didn't believe any of it. I did a, yeah. I did a big Scientology course just to see if everything that Hubbard said was still happening the same way, and it pretty much was in terms it's of- It's a slow you, process of deprogram, deprogramming. I would say uh, I recommend it for everyone who has had any kind of addiction that you deprogram and that you do therapy to deal with what puts you into the addiction. That's that's my recommendation. Jen asks, Jeff, did people tour near Philly? Yes, I think we did. I don't know if we did Philadelphia, but I know we were near there. And this would have been the tour of 68. And when we were touring around the country and then we did do uh, some dates with the Who which was super exciting. Yay, another wow. another group that that completely blew me away. So <clears throat> we had The Who and the, well, there's so many great groups, but The Beatles and The Who and Pete yeah. Sound, Townsend is brilliant. He is such a brilliant writer in yeah. my opinion. Well, Just, you're talking about your generation. Yeah, my generation. <laughs> uh, Felzik says, any relationship to Aaron Smith Levin. No, we're not related at all. Aaron and as I. As far as you know. As far as well, but we are. We're we're definitely from the same tribe, the Levi tribe. So, That's right. I think it's just his one side of his family, though. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's it's not the Smith side. No, but so mm. no, but I really like him. I think he's an excellent interviewer, and he made me really comfortable when I was talking yeah. to him. Oh, he's fantastic. He's really, yeah. really good. Um, yeah, does make he does make you feel comfortable. That's what's so good about him, I think. And uh, I'm just I've just been doing one of these heritage things, you know. So I'm looking. I've I've just I'm going to send it off in a minute. You can see who who all your great grandparents were and stuff. Oh, cool. And, yeah, so it's exciting. Um, right, Ian McClory says, "What about psychology and Scientology?" I suppose there isn't any. Is it's not allowed? Is it? Not allowed. None. Hmm unless the psychologist is um, kind of going off, goes off on their own and they support Scientology in that case, or some part of Scientology, then they would be okay and they would be accepted. Their, their practice wouldn't be accepted. And if you would like to go to a Scientology, uh, psychologist or a psychiatrist, pretty much that would um prevent you from going back to scientology if you okay, decide yeah. you want to do that they uh, hubbard hated psychiatry he hated psychology he thought it was all a bunch of bunk and the difference i see is that psychiatry and psychology progress they did have some barbaric um practices you know i'm not a big electroshock supporter at all i don't believe in that but they've progressed and they continue to progress. And I think that's the beauty of those areas is they will continue to progress. And my point is that Scientology can never progress because Hubbard's words are sacrosanct. In other words, you can't violate what he says. You can't change it. 
Interesting. Uh, I've got another from Simon Roper saying, Andrew, please get an interview with Grace Jones for me. Great stream. And uh -huh. Who's Grace? Who's Grace Jones? A wonderful singer. Huh. The one that Grace I know. Jones. There might be another cool. one, but there's a Grace Jones, a singer. Interesting. What does she sing? Well, uh, she's like black pop singer. She's got her own oh. style. That's completely cool. her own thing. I mean, she's completely different than. Well, thank you, Simon. I will look into that. And uh, thank you for the super chat thing. Very, very nice of you. Um, let's see. Oh, this one's for me. Heather Whelan says, Andrew, come to a meet up in Florida. We could have it in Clearwater. Well, maybe one day, but I'd have to be sure there are enough people because if I spend all the money to go to Florida and there's no one oh, there, yeah. it's no, well. no good. <laughs> um, let's see what else. Any other Mrs. questions? Mrs. J. Why would Scientology mask up and go bleach crazy through COVID if they are invincible? It was more for show. I think there was a certain, uh, it was uh, publicity. They wanted mm. to show that they were better at fighting COVID than anybody else. So I'd say that's what it was. And it really was a polit publicity stunt did it really help that much more? No, I, I do believe that those that taking precautions and is important. And but what they did was publicity. Oh, fair enough. How has your relationship with music changed since leaving Scientology? Any difference? Huge difference. Um, in the sense of I was creative. And I would I was, what would you call it? What would be the term, the psychological term? I would have points where I was on a big high and then a, like, um, and then I'd go on a big low. And they call it manic depressive or there's a more current term than Bipolar? That. Bipolar. The big thing was I used music to escape Scientology but it got so bad that I couldn't function anymore. Mm. And so once I left, I didn't do music for three years because, and that's in the film, it talks about it. Uh, I literally had a massive uh, breakdown in clinical depression. So for three years, I was inoperable. I didn't operate. When I got out, when I finally had the epiphany and realized what was causing this depression, um, like the dam broke. I was writing music every day. I was playing. I was, and that's the big thing is that bipolar issue is gone. Oh, and wow. So, so the creativity is pretty nonstop. And, and if people, um, I, tr I, I'm trying to, I have a website called music tracks channel on YouTube and we need to put a lot more music up, but there's music up there of my music and my collaborations with different writers and and but now it's just i love and i'm passionate about music and i love telling stories because i'll, I'll get put a plug in for my group celestial navigations okay uh, with, look with, look it up people yeah with, with jeffrey lewis the actor who a lot of people know jeffrey he worked with clint eastwood on every which way, way but loose cool. yeah Very cool. a well-known character actor we were friends and partners and collaborators for, for like literally 45 years. And we wow. produced, we pro he's a storyteller. So I got into being addicted to storytelling and performing as a story. We were music and story. And now I love making movies because you can tell a story and, and, and it's, Anyway, absolutely right. Absolutely. Well, well, on that note, I think, I mean, Mrs. J is asking, can we put a link to your YouTube channel? I'm not sure you have one. Do you? Do you? Well, the YouTube channel that's the best for my music is uh, the Music Tracks channel, MTC, I call it, but it's Music Tracks channel. And okay. we do have uh, different kinds of music that I produce on that channel. And then Celestial Navigations has a website. And then we're on Spotify. Oh, and I, okay. and damn, I didn't say anything about the new album, The Return of People. 
which is is current. We we just, oh, fantastic. We released it last year, so it's really a current album. That's on Spotify. And if you look up People or Rock Band or The Return of People on Spotify or or Apple, we're on all of those uh, different platforms. So mm. so yeah, music is my life. <laughs> you know, as I say. Absolutely right. Um, I've just got a couple more little bits. I've got sure. Alien Guru saying, I am the reincarnation of King Toot, Jeff Levin Truth. And they've given a couple of dollars. Well, thank you, Alien well, that's Guru. Nice. <laughs> I would yeah. never evaluate anyone else's life and, and what their history is. I, I know I delved into my history and I believe some of it, I mean, talking about past life history, I believe some of it might have validity. So yeah. I don't, I, but I don't, some things I know aren't true because they were proven not to be true. They're more current. So, but I, I wouldn't question anybody else's uh recollections or remembrances well that same person alien guru now says never stop what you were doing andrew gold well thank you um Great. alien guru it's very nice yeah. um uh we've got just a couple more tim greenglass wants to know if you are deemed an, an sp a suppressive person um uh, yeah i i am um i've never seen they actually release a thing called that's like a golden rod it's a color kind of a gold color uh, like release a uh, printed sheet and on it it tells my crimes and so wow. I have been categorized as a suppressive person and so wow. I have hundreds of music people and friends or acquaintances that I have they're all they've all severed their ties to me ah well that's quite sad for them <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, Claudia Ritter's asking thoughts on Urantia. I don't know what that is. What is it? Urantia? Ur Urantia? Some sort of mystical thing. I, oh. I guess we don't know what it is, Claudia. I'm sorry. I, I, don't, I don't know what that is either. I'm sorry. Oh, fair enough. And I think I'm at the last one here. Okay. Uh, and that is from Scott Davidson. Did Larry Norman, I don't know who that is, ever contacted you over the years to try to evangelize? Um, no, uh, Larry was a member of the band People, an integral part of our group. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did talk and he was, he never pushed um, Christianity on any other group. He was very quiet. I did see and did perform with him in a church one time. I saw his performance oh. and, and we had uh, reconciled because uh, we treated him very poorly in the rock group. But, and he was, he was a brilliant performer and an incredibly good songwriter. Um, but I think the way he would evangelize was through his music, through his thoughts. And I don't think he was ever hard, pushed hard on anybody. He certainly didn't do it to us. Um, I've got actually there's another question came through and okay. it's actually relevant so I think and it's capital letters sure. so Nicole Hetherington is asking does Jeff see his brother now oh yeah no we're we're in touch um, and he was instrument we produced this movie together he's the executive producer on our movie and and we talk he lives in uh, near Aspen but we're we're always in touch and, and oh. uh, which is great you know. That's lovely. Oh, lovely. And if he ever wants to invite me out to go skiing with you guys, I'll, I'll be there. I, well, you can talk to him. He's a very interesting guy in himself. He's done I'm a lot. Sure. He's a great skier, by the way. And, I bet. And... Well, you have to be over there, right? Oh, yeah. He's been skiing forever. Oh, well, Jeff, Jeff Levin, thank you so much for being on the edge, guys. Go check out. You've, you've heard where all the, all the, you know what, Jeff, afterwards, send me a few links and I'll put them in the description underneath okay. so that it's there. That's great. Um, but thank you so much and thank you everybody. Um, yeah, that's, that's.